Hawaii should really unite the world through I mean, whether it's culture, the political, we are in between East and West. If we could be the model for the world, then you would have better world peace. I think the world is one place. If people understand each other, there should be less war and there would be less competition but more co collaboration. But Hawaiian kids have to learn that first. Rose Tseng is a product of East and West. She was a Chinese immigrant who came to the U.S. as a college student and came up through the academic ranks to become the first Asian American woman to lead a four-year institution of higher learning. In a dozen years as Chancellor of the University of Hawaii at Hilo, Dr. Tseng was a catalyst for innovation and growth. Her story is next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. If you don't live on the Big Island, you may not recognize the name Rose Sang, but once you've heard her story, you're not likely to forget her. When Dr. Sang became Chancellor of the University of Hawaii at Hilo in 1998, she brought a can-do spirit, a collaborative approach, and a sense of urgency that would transform the school during her 12-year tenure. She was born in China and given the name Yuan Li. Both of her parents were medical doctors who took care of patients regardless of ability to pay. You started life in northeastern China in the same province that gave us Confucius. What was that early childhood like? Well, I was uh, five when I left Shandong, which Confucius was born. I have no relationship <laughs> with him. But, you know, it, I remember I was the third in the family. We have a pretty good house, but it's the four courtyard with four quarters. We're the s south quarter, and my family four of us and my parents live in there and the north quarter was the rich one for grandparents and and you know their relatives and you know we were comfortable but my, but my mother was always working sewing and things like that even though she's a doctor your mother was a professional who was raising her children at the time she was working mm -hmm. um, did, did she talk with you about the whole concept of having it all and what her opinion of that was uh, my mother came from a traditional family, so she also told me, you have to be a good woman and mother and, and lady and granddaughter, you know, whatever, mother eventually, too. So I had to learn how to sew and I have to learn to, I mean, being a woman means you have to manage the house with little money. And she is pretty perfectionist uh, and she taught us that women has even more responsibility than men. But still you have to be good in the world. You have to compete with the world because she showed the example. Because her skill, she was able to, you know, make the living and, and carry the responsibility for the children and for, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of money. And the family came from her clinic because my father get, you know, public servant is very little money in the beginning of Taiwan. So, you know, she's, she, she's my, I am the second daughter. Uh, we have an older brother, and my s older sister, and me. I would say, come to me, she didn't have a really, really strong um, hope for me to be the best in the world or something, but she just feel like you have to do your best, do your best, do your best, contribute. <laughs> so it was by position of child with the expectations were? Yeah, my older brother got the highest expectation. He has to be perfect in everything. By the time when I get there, I have to be good, but I, you know, I don't think they, I have to be the first in the class all the time. After World War II, Rose Sang's family moved to Shanghai and then to Taiwan to avoid the spread of communism. What was Taiwan like for the family who had just arrived? Taiwan was very rural and very tough that time. And because right after Second World War, uh, Japanese moved away and China, China Taiwan uh, is Republic of China and there's nothing, the school and nothing, <laughs> no economy. I mean, agriculture was bad, everything was bad. So we move in, my parents, my mother is a pediatrician and a gynecologist, and they, they find jobs, you know, they find jobs in the military hospital first. And my mother finally with four kids, she couldn't work, so she had a clinic in the house. Uh, we had to help out, no babysitter, nothing luxury, but we, you know, we get clothes, we get food, and we go to school, public school. And so we had a pretty, you know, tough, not really, really poor, poor life, but not luxury at all. 
A lot of people would figure since your both parents were physicians, there'd be affluence. No, no, not in not in old days in Taiwan. Right after the war, Taiwan was very poor. Actually, we were not the poorest. Some of my classmates had no shoes. Some of my class, well, I even personally didn't have anything more than maybe one pair of shoes, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to make our own clothes. Even when I was twelve, I have to make all my uniforms myself. Did your parents uh, communicate values to you about work and community? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what daily they, they showed us. Even though they were kind of poor, they have a clinic in the house. My father immediately come back from the hospital, you know, the university hospital, a medical school hospital. He has a full-time job there, make very little money. But then he come back, he immediately take his clothes off and treat the patients. And many of the patients don't pay. That time, you know, they don't have money. So my mother kind of helped out, and she did the kids and the, parent and the mother, and my father does the surgery and all that. I know they were busy all night, on the weekends, very little pay. And, but, but I see them doing that. I thought, well, that's life. Did your parents, as physicians, uh, encourage you to go into the medical field? Not really. Actually, they probably told all of us, don't go to phys become physician, or they kind of, I don't know, maybe informally, we saw the, what they do seven days a week, and the house is open for the public all the time, and we, we decided none of us want to be physician. They think scientists or educators mm -hmm. are the best. And they also don't like us to make money either. They said making money is not good. So in a way, none of us went to business. We all become scientists or... So what was the bias against making money? I don't know. My parents just tell us from day one, people who are rich are not as good as people who are poor or something like that. Did your father ever explain why he was willing to take in people that he knew would probably never pay him? <sighs> I think it's kind of... The, I don't think they had to say it, you know, basically we, we, we grew up that way. When the patient come in, we all have to disappear or go to the back. The when there's a need, you feel yeah. the need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We saw them doing that. And I think, you know, maybe it's just their education, their life, and they just show us. And they're very happy. They, we saw them busy, but they were happy. Her parents' work ethic was reinforced by Rose Sang's teachers, who recognized her potential and encouraged academic excellence. They would say, you're good, but you're not working hard enough. You have to work hard enough. And that was my thir uh, 13, when I was 13, my, my seventh grade or eighth grade teacher told me, I didn't work hard enough. And lo and behold, I started working hard enough. I got everything and I got an exam from the high school entrance exam, which is a big deal. And I thought, well, you know, I'll have to do just a little hard work. So from then on, this teacher told me, you're good in math, science, but you're not really good in PE. You better learn PE. I thought, oh, I didn't like PE. But then she told me, but you, you cannot be successful. You're not healthy. So a lot of things is hard work by somebody influenced you all along. When you were born in the same province where Confucius was born, my guess is you were not named Rose. No. How, how did no. you get the name Rose? Actually, my teacher was a Catholic nun. She said, hmm, you all have to pick a name. She gave me a long name and a Rose, and Mary, I think. And you know, I thought, oh, I want a shorter one, but Mary was in every textbook, so I, I don't think I want Mary. So Rose was the one. <laughs> and Rose is a nice classic name. Yeah, I thought, you know, I understand the color, and I understand, you know, I mean, I understand what Rose is. So I said, okay, I'll pick that name. I never knew I would stick to this for the rest of my life. I thought I was using a lang, but I never used Yun Li anymore. Rose Seng started college in Taiwan, where she studied chemistry and engineering. While she was away at school, her parents moved to Ethiopia to work for the World Health Organization. When Rose went to visit them, she caught the travel bug and decided it was time for a move of her own. I told them I'm not going back to Taiwan and I'm going to apply for some college in the United States. And I looked in the United States, I decided to east or west, and I got admission for east coast, west coast, UCLA and uh, the University of East Coast. And then Kansas State, <laughs> I decided. And I told them I'm going to Kansas State. They said, hmm, okay. I mean, they didn't say one thing or the other, too. They gave me 
like I remember, $1,000 in 1962, not a whole lot of money. That's the rest of, that's the only money they gave me. From then on, I'm, I was on my own. How, and did you, so you, you, began, you began applying for scholarships? Yeah, I did. And then I got, Kansas was cheaper a little bit. And you say, oh, yeah, well, like maybe $100 cheaper for tuition per year. But that, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So then I went to work in, in the lab. And, you know, I, I work in the summer as a waitress. What about the language? When did you learn English? Actually, I did not learn alphabet until 12th of seventh grade. And I went to school a year early, so it's seventh grade, I was 12. And then I didn't learn English until really Ethiopia. I went to Ethiopia and I didn't know how to speak except English, so I started practicing. And by the time I get to Kansas, maybe two months later, I was fine. I was able to understand enough because I took, I mean, I was a pretty good student in high school, so I took all the English grammar, mm -hmm. writing, and then I went to Kansas. And most people thought I could speak English, but there are things I really didn't understand. But, you know, I just learned by trial. And no problem getting a job? No problem with your schoolwork? Mm, no, no problem with schoolwork. Schoolwork, my math and science is so strong, so my chemistry, I get A's. But I, t I remember taking speech communication as tough. I remember taking American history and social science. That was tough because, you know, I have to do all these questions in a certain time. I understand that, but I'm slower to reading all these long questions. But I, I, it was tough for the first couple of years. Rose Sang earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Kansas State University. And then, once again, she headed west with a scholarship to UC Berkeley, where she would earn her master's and PhD in nutritional sciences, with minors in biochemistry and physiology. Kansas is very nice, I learned everything, but. But I, I miss ocean too much. You know, I grew up in Taiwan, and I miss ocean. I also miss tofu. <laughs> I also miss <laughs> not know. a lot of that in Kansas, no, eh? No, <laughs> and vegetable and fruit and fish and things I missed too much. So Berkeley gave me a scholarship and uh, actually NIH scholarship and then for Berkeley Fellowship to match up my tuition and everything. And so I went there. And it's, of course, Berkeley is a good school, too. And Let's talk a little bit about meeting your husband, because he would become your lifetime companion. Right, right. And we met in Berkeley. And he was a graduate student. I was a graduate student. We both came from Taiwan. And uh, you know, we got to know each other. And we met in the library. We studied in the library. So we both are not rich. So we go to a movie together occasionally and, uh, you know. But same values same and values. Uh, you could understand his profession as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. And then how did you decide when it came time to go into the working world, whose career led? Well, I think that part, I'm still traditional Chinese. I was traditional Chinese. I'm married with changing his name. I thought that must be done. And then I was following him. And I finished my PhD earlier but I did a year postdoc waiting for him to decide where he wanted to go. And then you went where he wanted mm -hmm. to go, yeah, which he was? Yeah, San Jose. He, he, he got recruited to IBM, so he, start, he moved to San Jose, which is not very far from Berkeley. And then you found a job mm -hmm. there as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I stayed home for half a year trying to say, you know, I don't need to work anymore. I can just enjoy life with a little kid. And my first daughter, my daughter is, is one year old that time. And, but I, I found myself immediately got into San Jose State teaching part time, San Jose City teach chemistry part time, and then I started feeling I enjoy the teaching, enjoy research, so I went back, and they, they recruited me full time. And then I found the first department of nutrition and food science in San Jose State when I was like 27. And when you became the chair of the department, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. that where you wanted to end up? No, I did a lot of things by chance because they didn't have a department chair and they asked me to do it, I did it. <laughs> and I think I just kind of grew into it because I was developing new curriculum, I was doing research, I was advising students, so I got into it. And, but in know, the back of your head it wasn't, and after this I'm going to go do that? No, not really. I, I think if you look back, I was just happened to be in the right place and people asked me to do certain things. It just gradually happened. What she calls chance led Rose Sang to take on more and more responsibility. Her ascent took her from teacher to chair to dean and ultimately chancellor, first at a California community college system and then at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, 
where she became the first Asian American woman to head a four-year university. Along the way, she developed a reputation as a skilled matchmaker with a talent for bringing together the people, resources, and funding to make things happen. I like knowing people. I like to build teams and how to work together. So, so I think basically now I look back, maybe I was born or, or happened, I had the opportunity to learn these things and I enjoy learning it. And when I learn it, I don't feel I'm not a very strong leader in a way. I don't tell people what to do. We kind of work together. So I'm a facilitator kind of leader, at least. At least in San Jose State, they tell me I was more, and even the union told me, you're not the true, true to management. You're more like us. But that, that was maybe, I don't know what the standards were then, but now the, the standard is collaborative leadership. Yeah, actually, I feel like I was, I was born to do that. And I didn't know that was the kind of things you should do. I mean, now, now at that time, I told my father, I'm not, you know, I'm not the kind of dean people think should be. My, you don't tell people what yeah, to do and I when. I don't tell people. My father says, they want you. If they want you, they must see some good about you. You've been there for the many years. They know you. So I think collaborative, facilitating, and not bossy, but still have the vision. Were you recruited for the job of UH Hilo Chancellor? I love Hawaii. I, I went to Hawaii for every vacation. And lo and behold, somebody nominated me for the UH Hilo job. So, so anyway, so it just came my way. And so I decided to apply, I uh, decided to send my thing in the last day. And it fits, it fits in because I want to get a smaller place. I get, want to go back to research and meeting with people and get culture and science. I'm a scientist, but with really understanding of culture and minority culture and indigenous culture, I love to learn that. So it, it, it fits after, you know, after a while, I, I thought, well, this is my destiny. You know, I go around the world, going back to, you know, between East and West. Well, you say it fits, but I can think of a couple of reasons why it might not have fit. For one, you're a hard-charging leader, and Hilo sometimes resists change. It wants things done on its own time, and you're from the outside, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two, two things that could have uh, kiboshed the deal, as they could have made, uh, they could have really hurt you unless you figured a way around them. I think I was, uh, maybe it took me a little while to figure out, but I did ask community, what do you want? I said, I came in from outside. Don't ask me for the vision of the university. Even though I was, a couple years ago, I was on the accreditation team for UH Manoa, so I knew a lot about UH system. Mm -hmm. So I thought Hilo was intriguing because this is the second university in the, in the state of Hawaii and still hasn't really polished. No, and it was feeling very, very marginalized by right. the, sis the UH system. A little bit, I think the people there all feel that way. So go back to, I came in, first few months I learned and tried to ask the community, what do you really want? And they say, what's your vision? And I said, I don't really have a strong vision. I want to get better, and I, but I want to get the university better, the community better, and the state better, helping the state better. and getting East and West connection better through Hawaii. And very vague, but then they gave me input. I had a survey, I was literally, you know, being a scientist, and I taught research methodology, I did a survey, and everyone filled in. I couldn't believe people filled in six page of things what they want to do. So I came out with, with goals, and finally followed the goals. You know, making university better, making you know, more Native Hawaiians and making culture and science together, and, you know, getting more resource, getting university bigger, getting true, true residential university. And a lot of things fit what I like to do. And they, 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 they came from the community, not just from me. I, I know you've said that the, the success of a university is tied to the community success, mm -hmm. and both can help each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you go about um, connecting the two better? I think my purpose is, you know, if we all want certain thing together, like in Hilo, the leadership of together, you know, whether it's union leaders, whether it's a business leader, community builder, national, uh, na native Hawaiians, we eventually see the same thing. Want to be a better place for the next generation. And want to Hawaii to be a better place. 
everybody wants a place to be better, but so many have different ideas about how to do that. And you've had to navigate some interesting yeah. uh, contradictions or, or um, schisms between, say, Western science and Hawaiian culture and the feeling about Mauna Kea being a, a sacred place. Yeah, that's that one people tell me is very, very difficult. I didn't find it that difficult because I want, uh, you know, first of all, it's sincere from my heart. I really be believe Native Hawaiians have a, so many good culture, good language that we really, in, as a, in a Hawaiian state, especially in Hilo as more Native Hawaiian, we have to make that the best. So we encourage them and support them and they're good. So we got a new building, we got a new PhD program and all that. And they're the best. Then I have science, I'm a scientist myself. You know, Hawaii, out of the whole place, is a natural resource. How do we protect the nature, protect the culture, and protect the science, and make the science best? Everybody have the same goal now. I would say not everybody. I was majority of people says we want the best for the children, and of course more science, better science, as long as our kids can get involved, and that's it. That's it. Your kids has to get involved because we cannot have a foreign science scientists only. Even though I, I may be coming from mainland, but I see myself as a, as a resident of Hawaii now. I think my university had to deliver some education so that the future, some best, the world best telescope, like 30 meter telescope, had to be able to hire our students. And they see the future. They could be the best sign that they can get Nobel Prize, they can get a discovery, and they have that hope. So, so we've been, and then in Miloa Astronomy Center is one thing, Senator Inoue helped me to build that, and he has the vision, and I carry through pretty much with the help of everyone. That's integrate culture and science. So now the kids in Big Island and everywhere understand science and culture can integrate or can help each other. And you can be the best for both worlds. We have many Native Hawaiian kids are in science field now, and they're doing very, very well. And they actually are probably better scientists because they have an interest in their heart. There are many people who just just be, be you know skillful, but no passion. They have the passion of protect their mountain, passion of understand the universe. They have the passion of, of everything they learn. I wonder how many of those of us who are outside Hilo realize to what extent the campus changed during your 12 years as chancellor. I'm pretty proud of that. It's not myself. You know, the legislator helped. You know, the the community people helped. The student helped. The faculty helped. But we have the same goal. When we work together, things happen. We just don't have time to list everything that blossomed while Rose Sang served as Chancellor of UH Hilo. Just to give you an idea of developments on her watch, the school added 10 new bachelor's degree programs, six master's degrees, and two PhD programs. It launched three new colleges, a foreign exchange program, and nine building projects. Student enrollment went up 50% and funding for research grants more than tripled. You know, the metrics from your uh, tenure are very impressive. Um, but what do you think was the most fun and notable f in terms of what you did? Because all this took, uh, it was all leadership and it took a, a lot of people, but what was the, the fun of it for you in terms of um, what you did during the day? I don't know what's the most fun. I think the, the fun during the day is to see students. And I, I think that's why I decided to move from a big place to a smaller university is the students know me. And I see them, all kind of students, the Native Hawaiian, the international, the mainland students, the Oahu students, and they just love it. Can you define perhaps the essence of your tenure? I would say I did my best. This place is a better place for the community and for the people. And in certain ways unite the world better through East and West connection. And the kids there are better citizens and better global citizens than before. You know, that's you know, just increment, but to the point of more broader impact is to the world. And the kids are enlightened to be global citizens. You didn't move to Hilo until a dozen years or so ago. Do you think you found the place where you'll live the rest of your life? 
Yeah, I like Hilo. I really, really like, actually I like Hawaii. I think I learned a lot the last 12 years from Hawaii, especially Hilo because I live in there. People are so sincere. People are so pure. And they don't get mad. You know, you could be the, I mean, you're the meanest person there. I think you can get mellow. <laughs> and I, you know, so I, I enjoyed Hilo. The, you know, people say um, they are slow, they are whatever. I find they're just so patient, you know? I mean, most Hawaii are like that, too. You know, I think all the Western people should come to Hawaii to learn you know, the real aloha spirit, you know, not just fake aloha spirit, the sincerity, the people, you know, the goodness of people. And, you know, Hilo is really, people are very, very nice. Your whole life, it sounds, you've been 24-7. Do you, do you have, what do you do when you're just, do you ever have a time when you're doing nothing and really thinking about nothing, just just mellowing out? I love edu education, but I don't always like 24-7. So I decided I need to step down, then I can have a little life, then I can still do education and still do things to, for the community. And I don't think I will ever just say doing nothing just for myself, I just enjoy it. I, I don't think I'm, I'm that kind of person yet. You know, maybe, maybe when I get a little older. Right now I still like to contribute. Um, you know, I'm helping, I don't want to be running the university, but I want to run things that helping the university, helping the Hawaii, helping the state. Rose Singh's advice for students graduating from high school and college is to travel, read, meet people from other places, and always keep learning, all things she continues to do herself. Although Dr. Sang stepped down from the chancellor's position at UH Hilo in June 2010, retirement was not what she had in mind. She told us she'll make herself available to help in advancing the goals of UH Hilo, and she'll keep working for more East-West exchange. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. For young people, I would say read, learn, and learn from everybody. Confucius said you have learned from any three of them. I mean, if you're among any three, he said he can learn from the other two, even Confucius. So I feel like, you know, I'm humble, I need to learn from everyone. And I think young people should, should just learn.